Studios.com, and I'm here today with a very special guest, Joshua Durstein, the amazing up-and-coming prodigy comic book artist who we talked to probably a few years ago now and since then has seen a rapid evolution in terms of his growth and development as a comic book artist and it's just been absolutely inspiring to see that journey unfold Joshua I know that you've blown away a lot of other people and I want to give you a warm welcome back to how to draw comics.net because we actually met a few years ago now like I said and uh yeah and now we've come full circle and here you are about to release your own comic book your debut title Emma Rock Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I really appreciated the last time that I was on here. You guys really helped me a ton, and I very vividly remember Eric Kennedy's critiques as well, and it's really helped push my work further as well as my ambition and until the point where we're at now where I'm finally launching my own thing, which is very exciting, and I'm really looking forward to showing it off to you guys. So. Oh, yeah. Well, let's show a little bit of it, of it off now because I think it's important that people see what it is we're talking about when we describe your work um, because it is certainly something to behold. Honestly, when you started posting out your latest art for Emma Rock Online, I was intimidated. I'm like, damn, Josh has really uh, leveled up here. He's... Uh, He's starting to overtake not just me, but a lot of other artists out there who have been doing this for a lot of years. And here you are just coming up behind us. And if we don't watch out, uh, you'll overtake us, I think. Uh, and it, what do you chalk that down to? Why do you think you've succeeded at such a rapid pace in your the artistic growth of your abilities? Well, I'd really have to chalk that because down that's a, to, usually a slow process. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so the thing about, I think the thing that really helped me improve so much is that I have a rather obsessive personality, so I can get um, obsessed with things very easily. And so art is sort of an outlet that was mm. something very easy for me to really get into and stay. Um, devoted to because there's so many different things that you have to take into account when you're learning yeah. how to draw that it's all just a you have to constantly keep pushing forward and evolving and I don't really like to stay in one spot for too long so if you remember the last time I was on here I had a very David Finch-esque style but I hope you can see that my work has sort of evolved past that and I've started doing more cross hatching, adding more lines and stuff like that so oh yeah it's crazy actually because i think that your style has now taken on more of an appearance that would be comparable to philip tan yep, that's exactly. who i think of when i see your yes. artwork now uh just the cross hatching technique so would he be one of your inspirations is that am i onto something there yeah. At this point in time, I would have to say Philip Tan is probably my biggest artistic inspiration, um, along with all the other 90s. Guys. Well, he's not 90s, but the other 90s guys that rendered like that, such as Mark Silvestri and Jim Lee and um, Stephen Platt, really love those guys. So they definitely inspired this new push in my style with this very exaggerated 90s feeling to it. And I feel like Philip Tan um does that so well because he also modernizes it as well and makes it a little bit more even more streamlined than it was and really adds that sense of grayscale into the art which i think anybody that's cross-hatching that's really what we're all pushing for so that's what i've been working towards personally yeah for sure josh you've got to tell me what's your secret what how exactly have you managed to improve so quickly is it just hours and hours of non-stop practice or uh 
are you watching some new course or tutorial that has given you divulged the secrets of what it takes to be a talented brilliant artist such as yourself and and where are you getting that motivation because I, I got to imagine that it's just nonstop for you. No one gets to that level uh, accidentally. It's very intentional, very purposeful. You must be setting aside that time each and every day instead of hanging out with your buddies on the weekend. There you are at the drawing table, smashing it out. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the difficult answer that it took me like a while to fully understand is that you really just you really just got to draw and you just got to sit there and hammer it out and that's the magic trick and that's such like a frustrating thing to hear as an aspiring artist because you really want something that's going to give you a formulaic way to figure this all out but the more you go on the more you realize it's just consistently returning back to the drawing table and putting the hours in and doing the hard work and it's not always going to be fun and it's not always going to feel good but i find that oftentimes when i'm most stressed out or most disappointed in myself or uh, confused about where to move forward those are often the best times for periods of growth because you're actively it's like growing pains you're actively getting better even if you may not realize it in the moment so it's it's constantly pushing forward and always learning and 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 being very focused on what you're doing um so the wonderful thing about <laughs> have not having a lot of friends like i do is that i get all the time to do this and pursue my passion um so very true now are you still in high school you're about to graduate this year right well i actually i graduated on saturday yeah <laughs> so Oh, congratulations. That's Thank strange. You. you graduated yeah. halfway through the year? Yeah, that's how we do it down in the uh, down in the states. So That's awesome. And what were your friends or the other students in your class, your teachers, what were they saying about your artwork? I'm sure you were showing it off to them. Yeah. So my biggest supporters were definitely my teachers. Uh, I very much appreciate them for everything they did for me. They very much encouraged me to pursue this as a passion and to work really hard for it. And they were really great role models in my life. And they were always excited and inspired when I showed them off, um, showed off my art to them. And they also happened, most of them grew up in the nineties, right? So this stuff was very interesting to them. And the school that I went to, there wasn't really a whole lot of people interested in comics or nerdy stuff like that. But the teachers were the ones who wound up being the fans of all that stuff. So that's where I really got to uh, show off my work and get feedback on it. And yeah, <laughs> one of them's in the chat. So he was absolutely phenomenal. But um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, Josh, tell me about some of the the challenges that help you to get to this point. So, the obstacles that stood in your way that you had to figure out how to get past. What were some of the key uh, challenges standing between where you're at and where you're at and and, and where you are now? And yeah, why do you um, think it, they were so impactful in in helping you get to this point? I think possibly one of the biggest things that really helped me out was understanding that you're not always going to be inspired. One of the really difficult things about being an artist is that we are creating brand new things to bring into the world. And that can be a very exhausting process and a very emotionally taxing process as well, because we're so closely invested into each and every one of our pieces that it can often be very frustrating to experience any sort of issues because trust me you know this there is a ton of issues that you experience on a daily basis just in the drawing itself and and hoping that your career is a sustainable one especially in this economy um but the most important thing is, oh, is yeah. discipline yeah discipline over inspiration and really making sure that 
you have the confidence to keep showing up and to realize that we're often very negative towards ourselves as humans. We, we are, you know, the famous quote is that you're your own worst critic. And, and so we're very self deprecating and judgmental of our own work. And, and that tends to set a lot of people back because they're scared to get out of their comfort zone and to, to push into areas that give them a great deal of discomfort, but really trying to embrace that and push forward in that direction is what I found to really help me grow and improve as an artist and a person. Um, and always being, trying to keep um, a good set of inspirations that I can always look back on and reflect on and be inspired from not only in terms of art, but also in terms of having a mindset that's fit for something in a creative field such as this. So, yeah. Yeah, it, it's definitely hard. And what's interesting about having a career as a comic book artist, or especially not, not even if you're hired by a studio, if you're actually setting out to do this on your own like you are, crowdfunding your own book, then you've got to answer to yourself. And being able to have that discipline to sit down and crank out the pages day in and day out, knowing that the only person who's going to dish out punishment to you is yourself. And so that's not very scary, is it? Because <laughs> you're probably a very nice boss to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, oh, hold yourself accountable by, you know, rewarding and punishing uh, the the actions that you take depending on whether or not they're, you're slacking off or you're inching closer toward that, that end outcome. But I think that in the end, what you really have to craft for yourself is some kind of philosophy, uh, some kind of understanding about yourself, the world, and why it is you're doing this. I think having a, a really strong reason behind the, the path that you're on, giving yourself a purpose is the thing that's going to get you to sit down day in and day out for extended periods of time and not do anything else because it's so important to you. If it's a strong enough reason, it'll be more important than anything else, more important than sitting on YouTube, sitting on Facebook, social media in general, more important than playing video games. And I mean, that must be really difficult to do in this day and age, the age of the internet, Josh, where there's so many distractions that could be stealing your attention away from your art and causing you to, well, certainly not progress at this pace, you know, one of the great abilities that you have, one of the great talents that you have is just sitting down and practicing and doing the work. It's interesting how be getting to the point that you're at, it's it's more than possible for most people, I think. And when you look at the steps that it takes, they seem simple on paper. You know, of course, there's different workflows and techniques that you're going to develop along the way. You're going to get to know your tools and and how you personally work as an artist. You'll you'll develop your style, etc. And yes, that does take years, but the steps to doing that are quite simple. You sit down and you start moving your hand on the page, and and you you, you get that mileage behind you. You get that portfolio of work becoming better after each piece that you complete. But the thing is, is that there's so many distractions, I think, for a lot of would-be artists out there who simply get held back in terms of their progress, take them way longer than it needs, than it needs to take, or maybe they, uh, they simply give up because there's too many other fun things that give them instant gratification that they'd rather be doing. So I think as amazing of an artist that you are, your true talent, is really the dedication and the discipline that you have to sit down and practice enough to increase your skill set, to hone your abilities, and, well, get to the point at which you're at now, which we can see very clearly on the screen in front of us. It's, it's just amazing. 
So how how do you combat then those distractions in the modern day? Because there's there's so many more of them than there was when I was a teenager. I mean, I still had the computer and I still had video games, but I think social media really started coming into play just after that. You know, probably I would say between 2010 and 2020, I mean, social media just exploded even more than it already had. And it it sucked even me into it. I mean, YouTube, everything. Right. So how did you manage to uh, to resist temptation and stick at it with your work? Well, I think that's the thing is that it's really a double-edged sword because now we have more learning resources available than ever before. And so we have exposure to all these amazing artists such as, you know, David Finch giving his tutorials online for free. And people never had that in the past. But at the same time, we also have an overwhelming amount of entertainment at our fingertips where anything is accessible at all times, at any moment you want it. And like you were saying with that instant gratification, it can oftentimes be overwhelming, especially as a young artist starting out um, and seeing the amount of talent that's out there and the amount of skill by all these artists all over the internet, not just comic artists, but all the artists you see on Instagram, all the artists you see on Twitter, YouTube artists, all of that can be very overwhelming because what happens is we often tend to compare ourselves to these artists when they a lot of times have had a lot more time doing this than you have. I find myself comparing myself to comic artists who have been in the business for twice as long as I've even been alive. And keeping in mind that all it takes is consistency is one of the most difficult things because it's such like an emotional immediate reaction to see this guy that's way better than you and and being frustrated that you're not at that level yet because you see so many different people that are able to do these things that you aren't and i think that can definitely be really frustrating as well as the whole part of becoming distracted or i get a notification and i want to go look at this thing and and trying to balance that out with the workflow and trying to find a good balance because if you do too much of one thing then it becomes um detrimental to your progress um so a lot of times i do feel guilty right. if i go off and i and i watch a youtube video or something but at that at the same time i have to remind myself like if i'm having an issue on the page sometimes it's best to power through and to keep trying to fix it but sometimes you just need to take a step back and take your mind off of it so that you can come back with a fresh set of eyes and that is where it's beneficial at that point to do stuff that is um you know gratifying or gives you a little bit of pleasure so that you can keep your happiness levels up so that you're not stressed out all day long worrying um about the fingers on a figure or something like that so i think trying to balance that and ebb in and out of where you're feeling most productive is important to developing as an artist and making sure that you really enjoy it because you know that's one of the things that eric canetti said that really stuck with me is this is supposed to be fun you shouldn't ever be at your drawing table and say i hate this i hate drawing and you know sometimes we feel like that and you want to pull your hair out but the most important thing is to keep that energy and excitement about what you're doing because i mean we get to draw comic books and that's practically the coolest thing in the world that you could do um so that's part of the mindset that keeps me constantly going and you know i think it's very important to understand where your happiness where your enjoyment comes from with different things in life because a lot of people don't think about this but there's two different kinds of happiness you can have you can get pleasure and you can get joy and pleasure is immediate. It's that instant gratification that gives you that instant high uh, that makes you super excited in the moment and, and it peaks your dopamine receptors, right? And then there's joy, which never quite reaches the same height as pleasure, but it's this constant thing where you're just happy um, to continue doing what you're doing without needing you know that constant gratification all the time because pleasure is selfish and 
Um, joy is selfless. So it's devoting yourself to a higher purpose, essentially. Um, and I think learning how to balance those two things are really important for having a healthy lifestyle or ideology or anything if you're trying to pursue something that is a very emotionally um, related thing, such as art or music or any of that. So, Yeah, for sure. Yeah, wow, you've uh, you've really got your mindset sorted out. I have to say, Josh, it reminds me of uh, when I was younger. I used to really get into, um, and I still do a little bit, Tony Robbins, and um, I, I don't know if you know who Tony Robbins is, but uh, yeah. other other people as well, like Tom Bilyeu, um on YouTube. Uh, these self help guys who really enabled me to be able to get my mindset straight because as you said, being an artist, it's an emotional journey. We often question ourselves whether or not this is something that is worth pursuing, whether or not it's going to work out for us in the end. It's such a huge investment of time. And you think about the career opportunities, there are many more than there were. And I think you have to tell yourself that kind of stuff as well. If you're sitting there believing that, hey, you know, be like scoring a job as an artist or being able to make a living doing it is so rare, it's probably not going to happen to me. If you believe that, then you're just not going to have the will and, and the level of hope that you need to push yourself forward. You, you've got to truly believe, I think, that you can succeed in order to have the wherewithal to stick it out. Because if if you even have a little bit of doubt, if you lack just a little bit of faith in yourself, and, and it's okay to certainly have days where you might feel a hint of that doubt sneak in, but you've got to stomp it right out immediately and say, well, no, I'm I'm the master of my own destiny. And every decision I make is what's going to determine where I end up. And that's that's all it ever is. At whatever point you're at now in your life, Josh, the level of ability that you have at this point in time, the any success you see from your first debut comic book, Emma Rock, which I'm sure you'll see a ton of it, Anyone watching right now, whatever point of life you're at, it's a lot of the, it's going to be based purely on your decisions. That's what's led you here. And so I think that that's the best way to diagnose uh, the dissatisfaction that you might feel in life if you're not where you're at, is to well, ask yourself, well, what decisions did I make that led me here and what decisions should have I made instead to get me to where I really wanted to be? And it's one of the greatest abilities to have as well, I think, just not not just for artists, but anybody is foresight, is to really picture in your mind where you want to get to and then figure out what steps need to be taken in order to arrive at that point. And I think that seems like something you've done, like you've really contemplated what your ultimate destiny is to be, what the end outcome for you is going to be Josh. And would that be true? And if so, what is the end goal? What's the end game for you? Where do you see yourself in five, 10 years from this point? Yeah, definitely. So one of the major factors that helped me to get to the point where I'm at currently and that continues to help me is this thing called irrational confidence. Now, the mistake that you don't want to make with having this sort of confidence is that you think you're so good that you deserve to be in a certain position that you might want. So say you want to be a comic artist, it's thinking that you're already at the skill level required. That's not necessarily what it is, but it's rather understanding that you have the ability to reach that potential and believing in yourself enough that you will be able to grow, you will be able to get better if you keep devoted to your craft and that you can get to the place where you want to be as long as you continue pushing forward. And I mean, that's one of the major things that you look at Todd McFarlane did 
you know, he looked at comic books and he said, mm, I oh, think yeah. I can learn. I think I can learn how to draw better than that guy. At that moment, he didn't know how to do that. But he practiced every single night and he got better. And, and he sent out 500 submission letters to all the different publishers and just being very aggressive with. And, you know, if you look at my Twitter, you know, especially in the early days, I was I was very, very aggressive reaching out to everybody that would reply to me, you know, Ryan Stegman, who I've had the pleasure of becoming a good friend with and and you guys and all sorts of other artists and believing in yourself enough that you understand that you're not at a professional level, but you have the potential to be if you put in that hard work and if you believe in yourself enough, which sounds kind of cliche, you got to believe in yourself. But one of the most powerful things that a lot of people don't utilize is this idea of just hope, but not a pointless hope, more of a very structured um, hope that this is going to work out if you work hard enough because there's so many factors that you can't really control that you have to take advantage of all the ones that are controllable and to keep pushing forward in that regard. And as I see myself moving forward in the future, I really don't know where it's going to take me, but I do know that I'm going to keep getting as good as I can and seeing what opportunities that opens up for me. And if I'm able to, you know, work at a specific company or continue crowdfunding my own comic books or starting my own company, you know, stuff like that. It's, you know, being very aware that the future can change at any moment, but also being open to any opportunity that comes your way and being able to adapt to that and, and to change to fit the circumstances the best and with the skill set required. So, The great thing about the future always changing and you never necessarily knowing exactly where it's going to go is it's a double-edged sword. Just uh, I'm going to steal that from you, what you mentioned before. It's kind of a double-edged sword because on one hand, yeah, sure, the good can go bad, mm -hmm. but the good thing about that is the bad can go good. So whatever unfortunate or terrible situation you found yourself in, whatever slump you might have uh, fallen down into, it can always change. And exactly. it begins by making the decisions toward a, a brighter future for yourself. I think that we have so much control over that. And I really love seeing individuals like you, Josh, who just take take advantage of it and and realize that, hey, I'm at the I'm not at the whim of life. I can do anything I want here. It's it, it it's there for me. And so I'm going to make the most of it. And uh and if I lived my entire life, if I never pursued these dreams, I mean you'd just be left with a, a well of regret. And that's the way I like to look at it is I want to do as much as I possibly can while I'm alive. All, all the things that I could possibly dream of because I would hate for them to just remain dreams. I think that would be such a shame. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> this has become a little bit of a motivational interview, but it. I think that definitely if uh, if you're out there and you've got and you're watching right now and you've got something that you've always wanted to pursue or – dreamed of being able to do it. it doesn't have to have to do with money or a career it might just be able to draw to a standard that you're personally happy with for your own enjoyment make that happen don't just let it remain nothing more than a thought inside your mind that uh, doesn't exist as anything beyond that you know it's funny you mentioned todd mcfarlane he was probably one of the greatest motivators for me as well when it came to pursuing comic books in particular because before that I was really interested in a lot of things, digital painting, 3D modeling, 3D sculpting, that kind of stuff. But that documentary that Todd McFarlane did, oh, well, the documentary that surrounded Todd McFarlane I think it was uh, the devils was in the details or something like yep. that. Yeah. 
uh, was just super, super motivating. And it, it infected me uh, uh, with, uh, with such a, uh, such an energy. You, you know, when you, when you become so inspired that you just got to do something with all of that inspiration, you, you've got to turn it exactly. into something. Yeah. Well, that's exactly how I felt every single time I watched that documentary. And it really did give you hope because he is a perfect example of the kind of attitude that you've just got to have when it comes to this stuff. That that unwavering belief and faith in in who you are and what you're capable of and that it's going to happen as long as you don't quit. It's going to happen. It's almost a guarantee. Exactly. And I think one of the important things that Todd brings up a lot is that you can essentially fail at anything you do. You can fail if you choose the safe and comfortable option and the stable job that is going to give you a stable life because anything can happen at any moment. You can get laid off. You can have health complications. So you might as well pursue the thing that you're passionate about and that you have a belief in that your life is worth doing that thing. Um, and that's the other thing that we were talking about earlier. I think it's like a, it's a Bruce Lee quote about be like water. So when you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. When you put water into a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Um, and, and so being able to mm -hmm. adapt to the constantly ever changing future. I mean, if you look at how much we've advanced in just five years with all sorts of different things, being able to keep up with that stuff and to overcome it or use it to your advantage is a very important part in always being teachable in what you're doing. Oh, for sure. Um, man, I mean, I think AI is a great example of that, AI art in particular. What are your thoughts on AI art? I mean, I haven't made up my mind yet because I see that stuff and there are days when I go, damn, why am I even bothering here? Like this stuff is going to get that good that uh, that in in some ways, objectively speaking, we may become irrelevant. But then again, there is also that philosophical and spiritual side to it where I've realized, I mean, I, draw, I just draw and create art for the pure enjoyment of it. Like I've never really done it for the money. Uh, it's nice to get paid. It helps me to draw more because I don't have to worry about paying the bills as much. But uh, it's, it's certainly more so just Man, it's the challenge. I love the challenge of drawing. That's what keeps me hooked is that it's it's never easy and that there's always something new that I've got to overcome in every single illustration that I do. And, you know, that's that's pretty cool to me. It's like a video game. Mm -hmm. It's like a really yeah. good video game that you just are constantly challenged by. And, uh, and yeah, I look at this AI art and I go, well, you know, it's – it's there's so many different ways in which you can think about it, um, but I do believe there is an intrinsic, unseen energy to creations that are made by the hands of an exactly. artist, mm -hmm. and and you feel that history. That that's the thing. I think with the art that you and I create, there's a history attached to that. There was a journey that was taken in order to create it. And it came from your mind. There was a creative process that unfolded that caused this thing to manifest, Emmerich to manifest, right? right? And, uh, and I just don't think you get that from AI art. And, and even if you were to um, hire somebody who could do really good AI art, I don't think the, the audience would feel it coming off of the, the, the artificially generated works right um i like i said i think there's just just this unseen human creative energy to it that people feel uh, and i know that seems a little bit airy fairy but i think there's something to that but yeah what are your thoughts on the whole ai art uh situation i did not see that coming <laughs> i really didn't um 
I usually get on this topic anytime I go on a show. But um, the thing about the human mind is that the capacity for creativity that we have is unparalleled by anything else or anything that's going to come out. Because I believe we were made to create. That's sort of our natural me too intrinsic intrinsic um thing that we want to do as soon as we're born you know you look at kids every single kid that i've ever seen is is drawing you know i've never met a kid that hasn't tried to draw before and and so it's it's not only a way of communication but it's also a way of self-expression and expressing your emotions and getting that really visceral energy that other people can feel when looking at your art just the fact that you understand that a human was capable of taking a singular piece of paper and a pencil and creating an entire universe out of it, I think is one of the most special things that you could do in your entire life. And the thing about AI is that it has no ability to create for itself. It's constantly taking from every single artist that's ever lived and compiling it into its own amalgamation of stuff. I wouldn't even really call it art because it's just a plagiarism of other people's art i mean granted it takes from thousands and millions of sources and jams them together but that's not really art that's piecemealing together other people's art and then saying i made this thing when you had nothing to do with it um and this i with ai i don't think it's very moral in terms of what it's doing and there's no way that it really can be moral because either way you cut it the only way that humans can create new art is through ourselves. Nothing else is able to replicate that. And just other than all the moral implications of artificial intelligence, it's also just breeding this very intense um, mindset of laziness. And, you know, because everybody, AI just proves it is that everybody has this urge to create, but some people are not most people are not willing to put in the hard work required to reach the certain skill level where they can create art that they find enjoyable to themselves. And so when AI came along, it created this very, very easy shortcut for people to partake in and say, you know, I can finally make the images in my mind come true. When in reality, you're just sort of conglomerating everybody else's images that the real artists came up with. And Again, typing a few words into the computer does not create anything, um, especially if you're trying to be a concept artist, for example, and you go on there and you make a design and you bring it back to the creative director and they say, OK, that's nice. But can you make it more um, alien? Can you add different features to it? And AI is not going to be able to create anything new. It can only take from what's already been created. So it sort of defeats the point of conceptual design if you're only ever taking from things that have already been created. So in my opinion, there's just so many flaws with it that it's impossible to actually be used in a way that's useful and not damaging to the overall psyche of um, society. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it's damaging to the overall psyche of humanity. Man, I, I think the, the internet is as well. It's offered us a lot, but it's also um, put people to sleep, I think, in a way and uh, yeah. and replaced the productive things that they could be doing with their lives with something that's just there to pass the time. But that's besides the point. Um it's interesting with AI art, I think, because I I like to have a, a balanced perception of what's going on. Obviously, I'm an artist, and it would be very easy for me to shut it down. But, you know, I look at myself as, a, as someone who designs characters. It's not like I don't go online and look for inspiration from other places. You know, I'm not just coming up with that stuff out of thin right. air. And, uh, and to be honest with you, if I tried to, it'd probably come out super generic anyway. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, I think that I think really artists um, want to be credited. 
Um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's mm. one of the differences with artificial intelligence versus humans is that humans can become inspired by something. We can look at this thing that we think is really, really cool and we want to take certain aspects from it, but we're not directly plagiarizing the artwork. Mm. We're not tracing that design onto our own design. We're taking yeah. this sort of silhouette that we might think is very uh, fascinating and we're applying it to our own thing and we're taking from these different sources. But at the end of the day, it's only your hand and pencil touching the paper ai itself is is directly taken from the source it's not even just inspired from it it's it's ripping it apart and putting it back together um so yeah 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 and it's it's also not as creative as you would think it is um right. from what it's i've just, seen of it it's taking the most uh, and it, 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 popular yeah, things um, it can find and and combining them together into the most you know like, for example, like there's, you know, things that get searched more than other things. So those things are going to be put at the top of its list to sort of take from. So it winds up with this very generic feeling design a lot of the time. Absolutely. And now I assume that's going to get better, maybe. I have no idea probably. how it's going to evolve. I figure if it's here now, it's probably going to get better, but... Yeah, at, at this point in time, I think that the main thing is that there's no um, control over it, really. I mean, you can put in a list of prompts, but uh, unless you're unless you're uh, they're they're applied in such a way that is fairly limited, uh, the AI actually won't do what you want it to do. Yeah, and the the only the only creatures capable of doing that, I believe, are human beings. You know, exactly. we we think of something specific or we're asked to do something specific. We want to create something. And not only do we create – so so even if we're taking, I think, from inspiration, taking from other artists and using them to, to inform our own ideas, the big difference with us is that we do build upon those ideas. Our brain has this incredible mechanic – that allows us to associate associate one idea to another idea, and that is the process, I think, of creativity. You know, you just can't output something from an empty bucket. You've got to put something in there, but then you you start to build upon it in your own way, and it gives you ideas that you would have never thought of without that inspiration. And so it, it is very different, actually, to AI. So my mind has changed on it. Initially, I was like, well, you know, AI is just doing what artists have always done and it's um, it's taking from other places and then just creating something new with it. But uh, my mind has changed on it because I, I think that we do work in very different ways and that we are much less limited in our ability. The other reason that AI art simply, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's destined to succeed in fact, people are already losing interest in it. It's the novelty is beginning to fade. And one of the reasons for that, I believe, is because when you have something that's easy to create and there is an abundance of it, its value diminishes significantly. Exactly. Now, if you look at the art that we create as, as human beings, it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and... You're not going to be able to create it in a minute or two. It's going right. to take you hours, days, maybe even weeks to create. And so the the value attached to human created art. Look, I th I've always think it should be way more. I think we gr we take it so much for granted the the value that should be attached to human created art. But you know, that's just me being. A sook. I mean, you know, in the end, uh, you can complain all you want about that stuff, but I still think that uh, there is so much value applied to it, even even if it's not always um, received. You know, I, I think that it has, has a heck of a lot more value intrinsically than AI art. And so, if you're thinking about yourself as an artist right now. And I know you've already got this handled, Josh, but I'm, I'm really talking to the other viewers out there who might be aspiring artists themselves. And you've seen this AI art come along and now you're like, well, great. 
you know, no, I may as well not even bother at this point. Here I was, wanted to be an artist, and it looks like I'm going to be made redundant. Don't think that way because, as you said, Josh, people are just programmed to take the easy way out. It takes a lot of effort to actually practice a skill, get really good at it, to put in effort. Naturally, we won't put in effort unless we need to. And so there's going to be a lot of would-be artists who might have been amazing, great artists who now either throw in a towel in the face of AI art or, or lean on it as a crutch in their workflow to the point where they can't pull off what it's pulling off on their own. This is, a, this is a dangerous place to be in because what ends up happening is that the artists who can actually create amazing artwork manually become all the more rarer. So their value shoots up even more, right? Because there's so few people who can actually do what you do, Josh. Right. Okay, so so you can think of the, uh, the amount of artists out there who would have been up and comers. You know, you think about the amount of information that's freely available, but that takes effort. And so while there is the temptation there to have something else do the hard work for you, you're not going to grow as an artist. You're, you're, going to ha- you're going to have, well, artificial ability if you use AI art and you'll never be able to pull it off on your own, uh, which is absolutely necessary because nothing sets you apart otherwise. If you forget, if you're an AI artist, you're like every other AI artist out there. You're on the exact same level, valued in the exact same way. If you're an individual artist, I mean, your, your value is within yourself, okay? As somebody who, who creates art traditionally, manually. I mean, it's, it's about you. It's about your style. People follow you. It's, it's ultimately um, personal branding. I mean, you know, it, I think there's been m- many artists throughout the ages who weren't even that great at art who had massive amounts of value attached to it just because of who they were just because of their name. And so it's it's the other way around with AI art. It's like you might have some cool-looking stuff pop out, but nobody knows who was behind it, and nobody really cares because anybody can do it. So uh, it's, yeah, it, th- there's so much to think about with this, and one of the f- reasons I find it fascinating is it's such a huge um, event within our world as artists and especially for you josh it's it's come about now you know i mean this was unheard of back in the day when i was coming up in the game but this is happening while you're uh, right in the thick of it with your own artistic development and so it's so interesting to talk to somebody like you who's going through that time going through that experience and just you know getting their take on it right I think that the thing with AI art is that it can never capture the human spirit because the ultimate thing about humans is that we mess up, we make mistakes and we get better and we build ourselves up from that. And you're never going to see that with AI art because every single painting that they put out is perfectly rendered and crafted in a way that it's almost uncanny how perfect it is. None of it feels human. None of it feels like brush strokes were applied by a person if you know if you look at any sort of comic art you would be able to see the hard work put into it and in the, in the, even the mistakes or not even just the mistakes but the white out or the coffee spatters on the paper or just the little stuff that really make us human and that other people can relate to and, and see themselves in and you just can't get that with ai Yeah. Yeah. I think the, um, the trajectory of AI is, is certainly going to, uh, probably take care of that stuff. Like you might even say that what makes human art so appealing is the mistakes, is the imperfections. But exactly. as soon as AI clues onto that, uh, it's going to go, Hmm, you know what? I might put some imperfections in here too, just to, right. uh, you know, get a little bit closer to that human touch. But again, the, the very fact that it's AI is uh, is what makes it somewhat insignificant, I believe. Mm-hmm. Look, I think it's really cool for 
okay, here's here's what I love about AI art, right? So I can argue both sides. And I think for artists, it's really cool for coming up with more unique references, more unique forms of inspiration. I downloaded this app on my phone the other day. You know, you're scrolling through Instagram and it says, hey, make your uh, face into an anime character or uh, make your face into a whatever, put a filter over it. And uh, so I downloaded this app and what you could do essentially was upload images to it and it would um, put it through an AI process and spit something out on the other end. And I was like, hmm, I wonder what happens if I put one of my character designs into this thing. And so I put in a, an old piece of work that, was, that wasn't that was even that refined. Uh, I mean, it was okay. And lo and behold, it actually built upon that design and evolved it a little bit into something that was more interesting than it originally was. And, uh, and I was like, cool, I'll put in a, in a bunch of other characters and see what happens. And it sort of, you know, it did its thing and it, it, it opened up doors to the potential development of those characters that weren't there before. And, um, and so you can take a, a really quite, a quite badly drawn artwork, put it into one of these AI generators so you're actually sort of directing the AI based on something that you have created. It's taken from a bunch of other places, no doubt, as well, to inform whatever it fills in. But uh, I think that's really cool because then you can take that and use that as your reference. So now you've got this, this design that you might have come up with, which might be pretty good in your eyes. You put it through the AI thing. It builds upon it, turns it into something even more interesting. And you're like, great. I'm going to use that and see what I can do with it. You know, so you don't you don't sell it as the end product, obviously, because I mean that's the uh, that's why people are pissed off, why artists are annoyed, because they feel like their artwork is being sold because these AI generators are just ripping it off and they're not getting the credit for it. Completely understand that, but I I do believe that in terms of enriching our sources of inspiration and making the references we use for our art more unique, AI art has some potential there. Like Emmerich, for example, you could throw in there and, I don't know, who knows what it would do with Emmerich. Right. I mean, my personal issue with that is that you're constantly feeding the machine. Yeah. You're feeding, and it's, it's getting more powerful as you give it more artwork and it has more time. I mean, the, the scary thing about AI is that, yeah. you know, you were saying it wasn't even a thing when you were up and coming. Well, it wasn't even a thing like two years ago, right? I mean, it was, but very niche subject. In the past two years, it has evolved and grown exponentially. It sort of reminds me of one of those alien movies where oh, you, yeah. you get the little alien creature and it's this little thing and then you start feeding it and then the next day it's this, it's like a foot long and then Five days later, it's like this massive behemoth of a beast that's going to take over the world or something. I mean, that's sort of what it reminds me of. But um, oh yeah, yeah. So you know, I just I just don't think there's like an ethical way to use it because, in my opinion, it's it's constantly growing and and every piece of information you give it helps to make it more. Um, usable for the people that do want to mark it off as their finished artwork so it's definitely a difficult thing to balance yeah it's certainly very true i mean the way i see it is uh it's gonna happen anyway with or without me so what that do i do true. yeah what, what do i do with that uh and it's just gonna get worse too so like i said i think honestly the best way to combat any AI stuff is to uh, to create your personal brand. If you've got a personal brand and people appreciate you for being a human, people people love you for who you are, uh, not just what you create, right. uh, then you can sell anything. You can sell a piece of artwork. You can sell a sneaker. It really doesn't matter. I mean, and it's more than possible these days as well. We've always had to do that as artists anyway. Uh, we just... We just forgot about it. I mean, there's an insane amount of art out there by very, very talented people, human beings. And what makes us stand out? Well, it's who we are. It always right. has been. 
And so I think if we remember that, then there's, there's no AI is really going to be a threat to us. Um, and and those who buy into it too much will find that uh, that they've invested into something that just lose, has, loses its value. It's like investing into the stock market. They've in, they put their money onto something that uh, it may evolve and it may grow and it may do some amazing things. But in terms of real-world application, it's not going to pan out in maybe the way some people think it will. Um, but yeah, and, and again, I don't try to be, I don't want to be bitter because it's going to happen. It's inevitable. And it's not just with art either. It's, I mean, if you look at chat GPT, for example, um, copywriters, uh, writers in general, I just, right. I mean, the thing is, is that I don't, I, don't, I still don't think they're out of business because uh, chat GPT is just going to give you a good place to start. I think it's great for, okay, AI is great for creative blocks. So when you run into uh, some, uh, yeah, when you, when you have a creative block, you can't think of what to write or you can't think of what to draw. The AI can spit out something that gives you a starting point and you can build off of it. Like I said, we're very good at building off of things, us human beings. We associate one idea to the other. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, it'll be very interesting to see how things pan out with the AI stuff. I mean, you want my honest opinion? I think it is the downfall of mankind. I honestly believe it's the beginning of <laughs> it's, Armageddon. It's the start of <laughs> the than, robot invasion. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. The one thing that... Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's going to be interesting times. That, that humans have over artificial intelligence is that anything we create is basically a culmination of everything we've experienced in life leading us to this particular point so each thing we make and intrinsically has a story you know with Amarok this has been an idea that I've had since I was 12 13 and I've just been developing it ever since and, and building upon that and the more experience that I've had with life and, and maturing and growing older the story has changed and reflected um, around that as my art has also gotten better Yeah, for sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about Amarok here. I mean, we've been so carried away in conversation, but I mean, this is a really amazing looking book, Josh. I mean, I'm a fan. I, I tried doing the Philip Tan style once upon a time. I tried my hand at it and I sucked, but you've managed to pull it off really, really well. And uh, to think that you're going to be coming out with a comic that looks like this, not only on the cover, but on the interior pages as well. Uh, that's really exciting to me. Uh, I'm truly inspired. Like when I see your work, I know that, you know, uh, you caught up on a, on a show with me another time and you were asking me for advice and stuff, but I feel like the tables have turned my friend. Now I'm going to be asking you for advice. Well, that's a really high compliment. Um, I really um, appreciate that. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no worries. So how did Amarok first come about? Why did you want to create a comic book about this character? And what went into the process of developing him and his story? Yeah, um, I think the thing about Amarok is that it's been, he's been a part of me for a very long time. And I think as, um, as kids, we all sort of come up with these original creations that we have in our mind and we never really quite let go of them and as time goes on they sort of evolve and change and, and grow and Amarok didn't even start out as anywhere near close to this it was you know the main thing that really inspired me was Joe Cotapano seeing his his channel was Star Circuit and he would stream every single day and that really inspired me to you know there's people making this and I can make this stuff too so you know every single year I would sort of have a different draft for what I wanted to do, you know, one year he was like a graffiti artist, the next year he was a speeder bike motorcycle racer, you know, it really just kept changing and, and evolving and different things have, have stayed with him, but he's really been a product of just all of these different creative experiences that I've, that I've had, so. 
That's great. And um, tell us, tell us what Emma Rock is about. So you know, you, you went through this process of trying to find who he was. So who who is Emma Rock then, and and what can we expect in his first debut issue? So Emma Rock is this idea that I had is what if we took the fantasy genre and we developed it thousands of years into the future so it's it's very reminiscent of sort of i was almost inspired by a lot of the different um advancements that have been making in our own technology with all the different you know TikTok, artificial intelligence all of that stuff and and the moral repercussions of that particular thing so the idea i had is if a society were to advance in a magical fantasy world, their immediate thought would be to take magic and industrialize it and turn it into a product that they can use that's easily accessible, that doesn't require perhaps the spirituality um, that was required by the older generation and, and, and really trying to take hold of something that's very sacred and, and turning it into a tool for their own use. But the difference between, you know, because we've been taken from nature ever since the dawn of mankind, right? And it's only gotten worse and worse as time has gone on. But with magic, it's it's almost like this thing that's alive. So in the story, it sort of fights back against mankind and and starts mutating. You know, the trees get huge and the animals become very vicious and and very um mutated against the humans and so they sort of had to sanction off into these large sections protected by magical bubbles to even exist as a society and as time has gone on magic itself has sort of been turned into a product it's been turned into this special drug that you can take to give enhancements to yourself and so it uniquely affects each user depending on their dna and blood makeup so each user gets a different set of powers from that drug um and that's sort of where we jump into amrock (laughs) he is this drug powered uh what we assume to be a vigilante and you know we see these different powers he has but we don't quite know how he got there yet i mean you can see he has his magic arm um and as the issue goes on you get a little bit of backstory but i'm not going to give it all to you in issue one because there's going to be some different flashbacks that allude to his past and how he might have turned into this. Um, So his power in particular is that the drug essentially turns his blood into a magical energy source that can be used to power ancient artifacts, such as his arm, which he uses the power with. Um, And you really get to see, this is a very character-driven story for issue one, so it's much more focused on the internal monologue of what he's thinking and it sort of just throws you right neck deep into this new uh expansive fantasy sci-fi fantasy world and um as the issues go on you'll slowly start to learn more and more about this world and amarok and how the society works because there's a lot of different interesting things that i have planned out for that as well and you get to see this sort of mystery unravel. So that's something I'm very excited to show everybody. But issue one in particular is opening up with a very action-packed sequence. And and then later on, we get to learn a little bit more about how messed up Amarok actually is. So, yeah. I really love the idea for that story. It's super unique. I don't think I've heard anything like that before. Thank you. I'm I'm very happy with the progress that I've made over the years because, you know, this has been a thing that's existed in my head since I was 13. So some of the ideas I had then still factor into now, but definitely that time period of about five years, being able to just develop it in the background as I work on my other stuff has allowed me to come up with something that I hope is is very unique and original and hopefully inspiring and and fun for people because i think one of the biggest issues that i have is that we're in a bit of a recession of of creativity right you see every movie everything that's coming out it's all a sequel or a prequel or a spinoff or a revamp or a redo and there's just not really a market for people to make original creative stuff because when people do that 
nobody buys the tickets to go see that movie or, or buys that book because it's so hard to market. But I'm really trying my best to to bring something that I think has a lot of value and a lot of imagination and excitement behind it. And, you know, this is the only kind of story that you can only make when you're 18 and, and full of angst and, and all that. So I'm just going full blast with it. Mm. Heck yeah. Seize the opportunity. Strike while the iron is hot. Uh, yeah, that it's awesome that you've got so much passion. It's a wonderful age to be at 18 because uh, there's just, yeah. Yeah, I remember having so much energy. Uh, do you stay up late working on this stuff or do you get a good night's sleep and <laughs> and, uh, um, and keep healthy? I have a very chaotic sleep schedule. Uh, sometimes I'll stay up late. Sometimes I'll get a good night's sleep and, and, uh, trying to figure out how to balance that as an artist, because I, I, I do find that I work better at night. It's, it's almost more peaceful and relaxing, but obviously that's, that's not great when you're getting two hours of sleep and then the next day you're getting six hours. And then one day you get 10 hours on accident and it's, it's all over the place, but such is the life mm -hmm. of a, of a creative hermit, you know? not really bound by the rules of society so oh yeah totally that's it mm -hmm. man i gotta say when i look at this piece it is incredible uh the way you've used your line weights you've mastered them Thank you. your ability to render and the different rendering styles you've incorporated into this your use of shape posing anatomy composition, everything. I mean, you've really, you're ticking all the boxes for the making of a kick-ass illustration that grabs people's attention and hooks them in. So yeah, I just want to commend you on that. I, I can see everything you put into this. Thank and you. I really appreciate you've that. You've done it massively well. Yeah, because I put a lot of thought into the... Um... The, the beginning stages of the artwork that a lot of times you often don't see um, because obviously I have such a complicated, crazy rendering that as soon as you see this picture, you're like, oh my goodness, that's so many lines. I just want to look at every little detail. But a lot of thought went into that, that pose, for example. It's a very simple, basic standing pose. Um, but I tried to put as much energy into it as I could. And so as artists, this is something you understand on a very intuitive level of of making sure that you make every piece have this sense of energy, even if it's just a standing pose, because I wanted him to be very imposing, but at the same time, very energetic. And so what I really workshopped out for that was pushing the pelvis forward in the back torso backwards um, to create this sense of, you know, it, it's a very cool pose and it's a very nuanced thing and perhaps it is. difficult to see when it's, when it's fully rendered, but, the initial energy oh, i can see I what you've done there has remained thank you so yeah that was the idea with that so yeah i feel i feel the intensity of this pose like uh like if i was to get into that pose myself and it would be a, an intense pose like there's a lot of be power behind it mm -hmm. and it's it is certainly coming through in this which is exactly what you want to see in a comic book illustration. That's what we talk about all the time. But it's also the way you've stylized and shaped the anatomy too. Like those uh, those lats behind his back there. Oh, um, just such a cool shape going into the lower torso like that. And then, you know, of course, you've got the muscles and the shoulders and the all oh, really, really great stuff. And then the rendering on his on the cloth of his cape and his outfit. What goes into the decision-making process behind it? How do you know where to place that rendering? How do you decide to, to render in that specific way in that particular area? Because it's you've mixed it up all the way through, but it works. Mm -hmm. um, so I come from sort of the school of cartoonish foundations with realistic rendering so the idea that comics is much as much about mm, cartooning nice. as it is about creating a very cool developed piece of artwork so cartooniness is 
one of the most important things I think in comics is this idea of exaggerating life. And that's why I get very irritated when people harp on the 90s and say, well, that doesn't look real. It's not supposed to. Nobody's looking at Charlie Brown and saying his organs don't fit into his stomach there because it's a cartoon character. It's obviously exaggerated. And that same sort of energy is not often carried through with comics because we are doing, you know, anatomically semi-correct at least figures and and all sorts of stuff that people tend to get wrapped mm. up in the in the rendering of it rather than the excitement and energy of the overall piece um and so for me i, I start out with a very fluid gesture something that's very energetic and gets it gets the motion across and then i put in my anatomy which i try to strike the balance between something that's realistic but also something that looks cool because if you take a picture of any sort of human figure and you trace it, you're going to realize it's not the most fun or exciting shape language. Um, so this idea of really trying to do something that prioritizes shape just as much as anatomy was very important to me because you look at somebody like Joe Moderera and he's not anatomically correct. He's a very shape-based artist, and you can see that in all of his work. Um, and so for me, that was very important that I strike the kind of balance that I wanted between realism and cartooning. And in my opinion, a lot of the 90s comic artists struck that balance very well. Somebody else that's a huge inspiration and mentor and friend to me as well, Rob Willis, is, is very good at capturing that. And as well as not only oh, yeah. making it it sort of energetic and hopefully correct, but also very cool because the cool factor is one of the most important things about comics because you want your audience to have a very visceral reaction as soon as they see your page to be like, whoa, that's, that's what comics are. That's sort of the reaction that I want people to have. So if you look at this, you know, there's a lot of different stuff going on. There's bounce lighting, there's different gradations. Um, I don't like to limit myself to just a two-tone cross-hatching. Um, you know, you can go one-tone, two-tone, three-tone, four-tone, and layer your lines mm. in a particular way that makes it um, sort of look like grayscale, right? Because the thing about comics is that you're essentially creating the illusion of grayscale because it's all eventually going to be in black and white. Um, which I'm very excited because I have John Livesey working on this and he's a 30 year veteran inker and, you know, he's inked over Mark Silvestri and, and Marvel and DC guys like for his entire career. Wow. So to see him sort of come in and, and add his magic touch to my work has been an amazing experience and something that I'm very excited to continue seeing and, and for everyone else to see as well. Um, so yeah and i saw somebody say something about the background real quick um i like to go very very intricate with my backgrounds because i like the viewer to feel immersed in the world just as much as they are in the characters so backgrounds are i think almost any artist it's going to be their least favorite thing unless you're a very logical minded person that enjoys the architecture of it all most of us got into comics because we like cool superheroes and we like drawing that stuff, but the backgrounds are so important to selling the overall idea of the page that I really spend a lot of time making sure that I make that look hopefully just as good or sometimes even better than the figure. Um, so uh, I really appreciate all the compliments coming in. Thank you guys. That's a really great attitude to have about backgrounds. Uh, yes, they can be uh, arduous and taxing and not as fun as characters, but it really is all about pulling the reader in and making them feel like they're a part of that world. And that's one of the best ways to do it is through the backgrounds. And, you know, an old trick that they used to do back in the day and that they do in Munger a lot is they'll have an establishing shot that's super detailed and that's... Yeah really all that's necessary as long as you get that nice establishing shot in then the character head shots you don't need to add too much background into those now i'm guilty exactly. of doing that I, yeah. I add way too much background into every single panel but 
um, sometimes that contrast and that room to breathe around the character can be a good thing. On a page like this, though, yes, investing that time into the background and the way it just frames the character like that. I really love your use of line weights. And the point you made about keeping an animated, cartoony style almost and then rendering it realistically, man, if you see my work without rendering, it especially exactly. the the female characters can look a lot like uh, either Michael Turner or uh, J. Scott Campbell. But, right. you know, you add the rendering in on top of that and it completely transforms into something that looks much more Mark Silvestri. I mean, that, that really is kind of Mark Silvestri style. It's just Michael Turner with Mark Silvestri rendering on top in a sense. Exactly. But, um, and then... Yeah, it's 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 really cool, and especially if you look at Jim Lee's work, he's he's really got that down pat. Mm -hmm. uh, he, you can see that he's got this very stylized look to his anatomy and his characters and his faces, everything he draws. But then you add in that intense rendering, it makes it seem much more real. But you know, there's something to be said about leaving out the rendering sometimes too, which I'm yeah. sort of battling with. I have to ask you, Josh, how long did this take you? I mean, it must have taken you a long time to do up this page or that rendering. So that's actually... Do you ever wonder if maybe sometimes... Uh... Yeah, go ahead. I'm actually like a very like... There's artists that can just sit down from nine to five and get the work done, get it finished, and it's a product for them. I'm a very much, you know, sort of artsy artsy fartsy kind of guy so i don't really like to time myself or say oh this took this long or oh this took this long because maybe i'll look at how long it took me and i'll be like oh my goodness i spent way too long on this but um at this point i'm on you know i'm only 18 i have tons and tons of years to develop my speed that i think it's much more important to get something that i'm satisfied with and to be uh worrying myself with the amount of time that it took um and I'm a very, and I'm sure you can relate to this, and I see this in your work and especially how you communicate that we're very much perfectionist with, we have to do this thing to, for example, add the environment to make sure that the reader knows where they're at or that it's grounded, even though that contrast might have wound up looking better. So we can often overwork areas that if we had just decided to do less on and have a simpler panel, it would have worked better overall, but it's very difficult for us to do that when we're so detail oriented compared to seeing the larger picture. And that's something that I've been battling with and, and something that I think is going to be an issue for my entire career, always sort of trying to find um, that balance. And I, and I just got a comment, um, saw a comment that said, is it digital or pencil? And it is actually, this is all penciled on the board. Um, I actually try to take advantage of all the technology we have. So I do this thing called Tradigital, uh, which is I do my layouts digitally so I can get everything situated and resized and posed and, and in the correct place. Because, for example, if you draw a head too big, well, you can just put the lasso tool and, and make it smaller and it's problem fixed, right? So for the thinking stage, I think it's very useful to use that as a tool. I personally am someone that loves the feel of pencil on paper, so I will then print that out and then pencil on top of it on on paper. So I print out the blue line and then I add all these crazy line weights and, and cross hatching and shading on the paper because I feel like I get a better piece out of that and, and something that feels more like the way that I want it to. But yeah. Yeah, that's super cool. Uh, I know that if I draw traditionally, like usually my characters are going to be slightly out of proportion or there's going to be some right. overall uh, compositional issue with it. And it's, yeah, it's because on digital you can really zoom out and get an overall scope of what it is you're dealing with, the pose of the character, the proportions, where they're placed on the page, how everything else is uh, placed and scaled around them, whereas if you're on paper, sometimes it's it's not as easy to get that long distance view. Great idea working in that way. You know, it's so cool because I'm learning a lot from you today, Josh. 
uh, just in terms of mindset and also in terms of your approach too. It's very wise of you to say um, that, you know, you're really putting the art first and you're not thinking too much about how long it's taking you. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's something something really cool about that because I think that's something that a lot of artists worry about and stress about, me included, but it can take the fun out of the whole activity of drawing significantly yeah. from it what I've very, found. very draining, very exhausting to be like, Oh, I got to get this thing done. And, and then it just sort of, you're not creating your best work then. And I really want Amarok to be my best work because I do know that as I get older, I am going to have to meet deadlines more often. And, and I should really take advantage of my youth and, and being able to take my time on this because it is a crowdfunded thing as well. So I have, more time to to do it and perfect it the way that I want it to look. And one other thing that I forgot to mention about, you know, Amarok is that he's very much inspired by sort of the modern gen bodybuilders. Um, You look at Chris Bumstead, you look at Alex Eubank, all those sorts of different guys, they have very, very wide lats and very, very thin waists. And to me, that is such a cool, appealing, powerful shape that I really wanted to infuse that with Amarok, you know, give him a big chest, big lats, and then a thin waist with the eight pack. Um, That was actually a creative decision that I really had to figure out because a lot of the comic art that me and you like to draw in the vein of, such as the nineties and David Finch and all that, they have these very wide rib cages. So instead of the abs continuing right up to the chest, the, the very barrel chested rib cage tends to stop that from happening so i had to make the conscious decision of i need to Mm. make this guy a little bit leaner a little bit slimmer so that he can have the fully sort of ripped look that i was going for Mm -hmm. yeah for sure no i love that look it's a great shape the light the old light bulb shape Mm -hmm. uh it it looks fantastic and yeah, it's interesting because for a long time I was trying to figure out, man, how am I supposed to draw abs? You know, I know David yeah, yeah. Finch draws them like this, but then I see see on regular people that they're not always like that. And I discovered that there's actually different types of anatomy uh, yeah. that that people develop. There's, there's different types of abs. And um, I believe that the one that they typically use in those 90s styles uh, comic book characters you know, like Jim Lee and David Finch is uh, what's called the Greek arch or something like that, which sits around the top of the abdominal muscles. But uh, that's only just a, that's that's just on some types of people. Uh, right. Other people have the abs going all the way up to the top. Usually, like you said, when they're when they're super ripped. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think it's a fantastic look, and and you just nailed it. This is the kind of character I see, and I want to know more makes me curious, makes me intrigued. So I think you've certainly got that tick box checked as well. Yeah. And yeah. Also, um, moving forward. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we got a bit of a delay. So go ahead. There's a bit Um, of a delay between us. yeah, Yeah. But if anybody thinks this looks interesting or you're drawn into it, no pun intended, um, I do have my pre-campaign open for signups, so I don't know if somebody can put that in the chat. There should be a link, hopefully, um, and you can go sign up for mm. that. And I don't know, Clayton, if you can find the um, – there's one colored piece of art that I put in there with the yeah. art that I included. That will actually be a trading yeah, card. Up. That'll be a trading card that is offered to anybody who signs up early and then buys a physical – perk of the book when it launches you will get that for free and that will be exclusive to anybody that signs up early um so this is actually a very cool art that i got the chance to commission from a very talented group of artists um i believe his name is arsony he goes by s soul jacker um and he has this very awesome style that i love and then i got pixel tool alonzo espinoza to color that Um, so when you guys see this, I think it really gets everything that I love about Amarok across in in one artwork. And so that will be the exclusive trading card offered to people who go and and sign up early. And 
there's only about six days left guys until the launch we're launching on june 5th so if you want this really cool trading card along with your purchase um go and sign up because you'll be getting it for free and i wouldn't want to miss out on this because it's a really cool artwork heck yeah it looks amazing i love that color scheme and uh you know um to see that cut and grad technique used so well for the coloring is quite rare exactly. these days so yeah. uh nice perfect for I that really, 90s look now hmm. i really love what they did with it because they just took what was in my head and they made it even cooler um so the idea that i have with amarok is that i'm very involved in sort of like the creative process of everything so when I'm looking at films, one of the things that interests me most about films is not only the cinematography, but also the color grading. So the idea for Amarok is that I have this very dark character with very dark rendering all over, but we give these sort of vibrant colors that sort of fit it. So, you know, his lightning is, is teal and he has a burgundy cape and dark teal pants. And I think those colors look really really cool in tandem together and then the city is this mix of an orange and teal backlit which you can kind of see in that piece as well um and so i'm very excited to see because i do have a marvel and dc colorist on this book i don't know if you guys have heard of him andrew dollhouse um and he's going to be doing some phenomenal work mm -hmm. on the book so very excited to see that but um nice yeah. That's really incredible. Um, and tell everybody where you're launching this campaign. So guys, I have not officially announced this on any of my social media. Um, I will be launching oh. this campaign on David Finch's YouTube channel, Monday Night Draw, 9 o'clock. And he will be drawing Amarok live. And anybody who signs up or not signs up, anybody who buys the book during that live stream will be entered into a raffle to win the original sketch of Amrock that he's doing. So if you've ever wanted to own a Finch original, this is your chance because there's a two hour, about a two hour time period that however long the stream goes on, that you have a chance to win that. And there's not going to be thousands of people there either. So you have a pretty good chance of winning if you guys if you guys want to try so hmm. that's so incredible how cool yeah. is that you must be uh that must be a really good feeling i am over the moon excited because david finch is the guy that got me into comics he's the guy that got me into drawing comics his youtube channel i remember when it came out COVID 19 that's when i really started pursuing comics as a career and so to have the opportunity to now be friends with him and for him to be so gracious and nice enough to let me launch on his channel and really give me a platform to boost this on is the absolute best feeling in the world. I couldn't have asked for anything more. And it's crazy to see how full circle it's already come just in the short amount of time that I've been in this industry even. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you are really developing your abilities quite rapidly, and um, now you've got a comic book coming out. You know, I worked on a, um, I worked on a comic book when I was about maybe twenty, twenty one, and I got to tell you, it didn't look anything like this. I was, uh, it was, <laughs> I had still a long way to go before I got to this level, so. Um, I can only imagine where you're going to be at five, ten years from now and how your style is going to refine itself. But, you know, there is this is a magical time where, in a sense, you quite possibly will do your very best work because there'll be so much passion and, and freshness behind it. You'll be you'll be so driven to succeed. And and once you do succeed, it's it's sometimes hard to keep that going. You know, but mm -hmm. uh, that's why you've just got to value it so much now and try to find reasons to to keep on pushing forward as you get to each level of success. But you know, I think that you know David Finch is an amazing uh, 
not just an artist, but an amazing person. I mean, that's how I first learned to do what what I'm capable of doing now. I wouldn't be the I always say it. I wouldn't be the artist that I am today exactly. without David Finch's uh, courses that you used to be able to get on the Nomon Workshop. And I just remember watching those videos, redrawing everything that I saw within them over and over again, just being obsessed about. Mm -hmm. Because, because you know, when you see that stuff, it makes you feel like it's it's actually possible for you to be able to do it, given enough time, given enough dedication. It's not like just a a lucky draw; you actually have control over that. And so, yeah, David Finch was a, a game changer for me, you, and a lot of other people. And uh, and just the fact that he's an all around nice guy, and he's he's yeah. supporting you in this way, and he's he's out there all the time, just you know putting out pearls of wisdom on his YouTube channel. Everybody needs to go over and subscribe to David yeah, Finch's YouTube subscribe. channel. It's so yeah. easy to take that it's so easy to take that wealth of knowledge for granted because it's freely available, but no, it's it is so valuable and you've got direct access to it and if you listen to his words and you watch his demonstrations, uh, it will be a game changer for you if you take them to heart and apply what he's teaching. It really, really will be. I, I can't reiterate that enough. Just sitting down, watching, and doing will make all the difference. And if if it really matters to you, your art and and being the artist that that you hope to be, being able to create the kind of stuff that inspired you to become an artist in the first place, it's so worth just setting thing everything else aside, jumping onto David Finch's channel and starting up a video on the next thing that you want to learn or the thing that's challenging you at that particular point in your journey. I think that people like David Finch, you know, just talking to you today, Josh, people like David Finch, Rob Willis, who you mentioned, and so many people who are going to get behind this project, they hear you talk with passion and um, they sense that... Uh, that drive within you and and your wisdom as well. I think your, your wisdom is is something that really stands out to me. You, you bring a, a fresh perspective to the table for a, uh, well, I, I like to think of myself as still a young artist, but I'm not as young as you. Um, so, so you give me a fresh perspective on things and I'm sure you do that for a lot of other people and, uh, and hold on to that and carry it forth, grow it and... I think you're going to achieve some really amazing things. I mean, you're just off to a flying start. Uh, you, you're, you're skipping, uh, you're going from A to C, skipping B completely, almost. I mean, yeah, you've worked hard to get to this point, but it's just, I mean, heck, it's uh, it's like what we were talking about with the AI art. You're just, uh, you're, you're going straight. Upwards. Yeah. You, you're just, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. And it's, I think that Emma Rock is going to do extremely well. Um, you know, just looking at uh, your following on Twitter and the amount of people that have reacted to it, it's so cool to see, man, that especially in this day and age, it's so possible for someone as young as yourself to create a, to have the knowledge available to get to this point within your artistic ability and to create an actual comic that makes, uh, real money and gives you real success so that you can keep on doing that stuff. Never before have we lived in a better time. Exactly. Um, yeah, I'm really hoping that this campaign does well and that I'm able to raise a good amount of money from it so that I can, you know, keep doing this, maybe move out and, and keep drawing comics. But again, it's like, that's a bit of the frightening thing is that you never know how well it's going to do because you can get any amount of money from any amount of money. Oh yeah, so it's scary. It's it's definitely a scary thing to jump into, and and I put so much time and, and passion and effort into this, and it, I just hope that it has an audience that it resonates with, and and that people will want to buy it and uh, support my work, and and I'm really anxiously but excitedly looking forward to launching it and uh, seeing how it does because you know that defines how I move forward with all of this so your guys support you guys are my entire support so yeah 
Well, uh, yeah, man. I mean, it's it's super cool. And let me ask you, uh, what do your parents think? You know, you said you're still living at home. So uh, uh, are your parents looking at what you're pulling off here? Are they blown away? Yeah, pretty much. Um, they don't really understand comics very well, but I have done my absolute best to explain <laughs> it to them. And, and from what I've been able to translate yeah. into you know, the general audience that they're accustomed to of not really knowing much about comics. Mm. They have learned quite a bit about it over the years, having to deal with my very long speeches about comics. Oh, for um, sure. So they're very excited. They're very proud. And I'm very thankful for their support and that uh, they're, mm. you know, saying good job and, and keep doing this and that they're very, very supportive of it, even if they may not you know, 100% understand it, but I'm very grateful that they're excited yeah. about it. And, uh, and yeah, mm. whole, whole family's excited, even if the that's whole really family, great to hear, even if they don't understand much about it, but they can at least, they said they can at least appreciate the artwork going into it. So <laughs> that's nice. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I think a lot of us can relate with that. Um, you know, I, I know my uh, my parents uh, certainly um, have probably never read a comic book in their life, mm -hmm. um, but uh, they're, they're proud, you know. And so, yeah. I think uh, I think that's what's really awesome is that um, you know people don't need to understand necessarily what it is you're doing to to sense the amount of passion and effort that you're putting into something. And uh, it's very clear coming from you today, Josh, that you've got copious amounts of that and it's going to take you a long way so i think we'll uh wrap it up here for today but i'm really looking forward to having you back when you've launched the campaign so that uh we can get you back on again i mean heck i'd love to have you on as a regular list uh, as a regular guest because uh you've just got so much uh insight to share um and you're so well spoken It'd be it'd be a waste not to have you back on here. Honestly, I'm, I'm well, sorry that it took so long to get you back on here. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and I love I love the first time I got to come on here, and I love the second time I got to come on here. So I would love to continue coming on here and, and keep talking comics. Um, before we end the show, if you want to show people, I saw Kanan was in the chat. So if you could pull up the Kanan White. Oh cover. yeah. I think people are going to lose their minds over that. One oh, I didn't know you had one. Yeah, it's in there. Um, you got to scroll yeah, down. Yeah, White's bit. incredible. Yeah, his art. If you thought I my art was good, just wait until you see his. Oh man. Yeah. Kanan, uh, you know, man, back in the day, I uh, when I was just a teenager, I had reached out to Kanan. I saw his stuff on Deviant Art. Do you know what Deviant Art is? Have you ever been yep. on there? I've, um, I didn't really get off on there, yeah, but I know what it is. But yeah. It's been around for a long time. And mm -hmm. yeah, I remember reaching out to Canon and just saying, like, give me some advice. How are you doing what it is you're doing? And it is it is surreal. It's, it's almost like uh, it, it's amazing that we can be in direct contact and, and interact with these amazing talents like David Finch and Kanan White and, uh, I mean, be able to commission them. Like yeah. I've commissioned Kanan as well and just – when you see a great artist draw your characters in, in it's, this it's way – It's the coolest thing ever. It's, uh, it is so inspiring, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But that's right. funny Sorry, that you – Sorry, let me get this up. I thought I was that sharing. you bring that up because – Kanan's obviously been around for a while, but he's actually one of the artists that I reached out to as well when I was mm. just starting learning. And I was asking him, hey, how do I fix my composition? How do I, who should I study? Who should I look at? And, and he was right there helping me. And he's always been very open to giving me advice and, and very gracious enough to take time out of his very busy schedule to do this commission as well. And it turned out phenomenally. And I can't, you know, you look at that and it's like, I can't mm -hmm. believe the amount of skill that went into that. It's just absolutely baffling when you see it. Um, so, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I love this piece. The, the way he's drawn the legs is incredible. 
just such so great shape energy. and exactly. um mm. yeah nice i love that you must be uh super excited about this cover yeah i was i was over the moon i still am i'm like i get hyped every single time that i see it um and i'm even more excited to see what it looks like when it's colored mm. because we're having andrew dollhouse color this one too um and if you also want to pull oh, up nice. the rob the rob willis cover that one blew me away as oh we well. gotta get yeah yeah you read my um, mind yeah <laughs> this this rob willis cover oh my goodness i couldn't I, i'm a huge fan of rob willis yeah. I could not believe this cover when I saw it. Yeah, this is uh this is probably one of my favorite pieces that he's ever created. Well, it's um, definitely it is my just favorite. Mind-bogglingly, yeah. bogglingly awesome. Yeah, this is what I is mean, this? obviously I'm a little bit biased with it, but this is definitely my favorite piece of artwork that he's ever created. Of course. And the amount uh, of inspiration that this it gives is incredible. Me and this is, is the so much yeah this is the full thing i just want to zoom out a little bit there so you can see that the full awesomeness of the just the composition but then if we zoom in here so much detail just how awesome is that mm -hmm. absolutely amazing the the way he draws anatomy like the arm there such awesome shape and stylization i also love his rendering it's uh he's got that david finch look but i don't know there's there's something unique about it that it's not it's not quite david finch he's got his own thing going on there yeah and then you've got um this incredible bottom portion as well um <laughs> Sorry, my, my kid's a little bit upset for some reason. Doesn't want to go down for a nap. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think I might have froze. Oh. Okay, I'm back. I can still see you for a little bit. Okay, that's good. Okay, cool. <laughs> so All good. No, yeah, that's okay. The thing that I really love about this cover is that when I commissioned him, I was like, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Do whatever you want to do on this cover. And it's going to be cool. All right. I'm not going to be some editorial telling you, you know, you have to give me these different layouts and, and I'll pick one. I was like, no, do whatever you think is coolest because I trust his vision. 110% more than mine. And he absolutely blew it out of the park. Um, but the gargoyle is just, he designed that all by himself and it looks exactly the same vibe that I'm going for with Amarok. This very gothic, dark fantasy, but also cyberpunk feel to it. And he just absolutely nailed it. And I couldn't be more happy or excited with how it turned out. Yeah, man, that's, this is absolutely amazing. Oh, and one other good thing move is that, letting uh, Rob Willis do his thing is that he was actually gracious enough to design the logo as well for the title. Um, and oh, wow. I had told him, yeah, I had told him to just you know do something that feels a little bit handwritten, that feels kind of gnarly and cool, like the Max or the Creech, you know, stuff like that. And he just delivered this absolutely bombastic, super iconic feel mm -hmm. for the logo. That was exactly what I was looking for. It's super gothic. It's super, you know, just it embodies everything that I want Amarok to feel like as well. And I don't even think he's aware of this, but mm -hmm. Amarok is essentially the Inuit Native American word for for wolf. It's like there's sort of this mythical creature that's this lone wolf which actually ties into the story but if you look at the logo it almost looks like wolf fangs coming down um which is just so cool mm. um because it just i don't mm -hmm. know it just knocks it that out is of park amazing and, park in every single way and uh i'm actually very excited i commissioned him again yeah. to do the so i opened an llc my own company called Knox Comics. So he's going to be doing the logo for that as well. And I'm very much looking forward to see 
uh, what he does with that one too. So. Mm, sweet. I mean, it looks freaking phenomenal. That's for sure. I didn't know he designed that as well, but uh, yeah. it, it does really suit the character and the vibe of the book. The crazy thing is that the more I get to know mm. Rob, the more that I become aware of how crazy his entire life has been. I mean, you know, he's been a tattoo artist. He's been a fine artist. And, and he finally was able to land on comics and, and be able to make a living out of it uh, with the age that we live in. But he has had an amazing experience and history with throughout his life, which is just gives him so much like skill. And it's crazy inspiring to see. Oh, yeah. He's one of the most talented individuals. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man, this is stunning. Um, well, I guess we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there. Um, and um, yeah, I better go and s check on my kid, make sure she's okay. She's having a, I'm not sure if you can hear that coming through the microphone or not. Yeah. But um, yeah. Anyway, man, it's it's really been so amazing to chat with you today. It's it's been one heck of a blast to just see what you've been working on and the the incredible artists that you've got involved with this thing. Uh, I know that it's going to be one of the the biggest campaigns that that we for a comic book that we've seen in a long time. It's going to be huge. It's going to be a hit. I sure hope. Not so, only man. because of yeah, yeah. Not, not just because of your, of your ability, and it's also because this is just a cool looking character. Amarok looks fantastic. He really does look like he came right out of the nineties. So, um, um, yeah, exceptionally very, beautiful very work, man. And happy yeah, best of luck. The, um, very excited with the design that I landed on because it really captures the energy of everything that I love about comics. And uh, yeah, I just think it looks. You know, not to toot my own mm -hmm. horn, but seeing other artists draw it, it's just a very iconic, fun, totally cool design. So I'm very excited with the design that I eventually landed on and how other people have been interpreting it, not only in the uh, professionals that I've hired, but also the amazing fan art that's been coming in. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, man. Really awesome stuff. All right, well, we'll definitely have you back here again. And, uh, yeah, man, best of luck with this thing. I think that uh, you're going to do really well with it. And thanks so much for joining me today. It's been a heck of a time chatting with you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate this, and I appreciate the talk that we were able to have and really inspires me and motivates me to make this the best that I can. And if anybody's watching and you haven't signed up yet, I mean, what are you waiting for, you know? So uh, please go sign up and thank you so much for having me on here. And uh, I would love to come on again, obviously. So, yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah, man. Big thank you to the chat for joining us today. Uh, it's been uh, really awesome to have you here as well. We hope you're as psyched about Emma Rock as we are. And uh, stay tuned for more. Be sure to uh, hit the link in the description below to sign up to the email list and be notified exactly when Emma Rock goes live. And remember that the launch of Emma Rock is going to be on David Finch's channel, which is super cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Until next time, everyone. Take care of yourselves. Keep on practicing and uh, keep, the, keep creating. That's the most important thing. And we'll see you next time.